Hello everyone. I can't wait to share this week's stories with you. We have a spooktastic collection that are guaranteed to make you feel uneasy. So, sit back and enjoy as we drift further into Mr. Creep's mind. I'm an exterminator. This is the weirdest thing I've ever encountered. Written by Organic Prozac. I work for my local council as an exterminator. Mainly, I get called out to abandoned properties with no owner around to control for pests. Needless to say, I see some pretty wild infestations and to be honest, after 7 years on the job, not much really gets to me. The job I'm going to tell you about made the worst thing I had seen until that day look like cobwebs in your grandma's attic. The place is in a sleepy suburb well outside of town. It took about a half an hour to drive there for control. A nice neighborhood, trees, sidewalks, porches, and swings. When I arrive, I get out of my truck, and I prepare to inspect the site. Neighbors had called it in a few days before, but it's summer and we're getting outbreaks popping up all over town. Business is good, so to speak. The concerned elderly couple next door mentioned to Control that a guy had been living in the place for the past year or so, but they hadn't seen him for a while, and figured he must have moved back to wherever he came from. I thought nothing of it. A job's a job. As soon as I see the house, I can tell something ain't right. The place looks like it's been abandoned for decades. The porch is covered in cobwebs, so thick that I can barely see the front door. What strikes me as strange are the windows, all boarded up from the inside. Now why would somebody board their windows up from the inside? I think as I walk up. Surely the point is to stop the glass from getting broken. I set to work on the webs, cutting them back with my crowbar. But they're strong, tough as a fishing wire. I nearly brained myself in the first swipe expecting to go straight through, but instead my bar bounces off like rubber. So I go back to the truck and get out the shears. Sometimes we have to do a little garden work to get to the outdoorsy bug hive, so I always have my landscaping tools handy, and I set to work on hacking my way to the door. When I finally get through the webs, the door won't budge. I smash my way through with the bar and as I breach into the hallway, all I smell is death. Old death. I smelled it a few times before. Usually a family pet thought to have run off, or some kind of wild animal that crept in to die somewhere private. Never smelled anything like this though. This place was thick with it. I gag as I get a nose full of it, and I almost get myself caught in the web outside as I recoil from the stench. A gas mask is going to have to come out early on this job. The mask does a little to help my nose, but it ain't helping my eyes. I can't see anything in this place. The broad daylight outside does nothing to cut through the maze of webs beyond the open door. There's this kind of dust that floats in the air too, like a cave silt kicked up by a diver. It's so dense, my flashlight can barely penetrate it. I go in anyway. A fool I am. I should have called it there and just had the place torched and been done with it, thinking back on it. You know, hindsight and all. So, I'm making my way down this dank hallway, ducking under the webs where I can and snipping them away where they're too thick to pass. The whole time, I can only see about three feet in front of me through this weird dust. Now I'm trying to locate the source of the infestation, the hive, but I don't even see any bugs. I figure they're probably scared off by me bashing down their door, but they don't usually stay hidden for too long. Not this long. I press on anyway, ignoring instinct to run. I'm starting to feel like a rookie on his first bug hunt. I ain't felt like this for years. 
and every step I take, more of the smell gets through my mask. My eyes are watering now too, which makes the visibility even worse. And I just want to finish the job and get out at this point, and I've only been in this place less than 10 minutes. I'm reaching out to steady myself when my hand finds a doorknob. The smell is so strong here. I turn the doorknob and I go in. This must be it, I figure. The smell's so strong, it's gotta be in here. As I take a step inside, I go tumbling head over heels down the stairs behind the door. Found the basement. By some miracle, my mask stays on my face. I'm pretty sure if it had fallen off, I wouldn't have made it down there. So, I'm laying at the bottom of the stairs on the concrete, trying to get my bearings. It's pitch black down here. I shine my light around me, but it's like shining your high beams in thick fog. All it does is create a light bloom around my face, failing to illuminate my surroundings at all. Man, could I lie. My heart's beating fast now and my shoulders have busted up pretty bad. And then I hear it. The scuttling. It's like tiny needles plinking on the concrete around me. It's not soft. Just a few feeling the air out, sensing the intruder. But suddenly, the room swirls to life around me and I hear the swarm. And they're not even on me but it's like I can feel them squirming out of the dark. A cacophony of legs racing towards me. I lose it. I scramble back up the stairs, bashing into the wall and crying out in pain. I've got no idea the kind of bug that will defend their territory so aggressively as this, but I don't want to wait around to find out what they are. I bolt through the door and slam it behind me. The open front door has cleared the dust a little, and I hobble towards the rectangle of light that feels like my salvation. I hear the swarm swirling behind the basement door. They don't come under it, just pressed against it in their mass like a bean with one mind. I can hear them clicking, smelling me. I burst through the front door, and I hurl myself over the porch and onto the front lawn. My mask finally goes flying, and I get a lungful of that dust. It coats my throat and it sends me into a coughing fit. I don't know if you've ever been sprayed by a CO2 fire extinguisher, but it feels like that. A chemical drat making its way through my breathing ways, sticking to the walls of my insides, making it impossible to breathe. I gasp and ratch, crawl to my vehicle for my water bottle, certain that I'm going to pass out and choke. I make it just in time and I down the whole thing. Then I just sit there for a while, gulping air, staring back at the house. What the heck was that? I ain't never heard of that kind of stuff. Needless to say, I don't go back inside. I call control and recommend that the area is cordoned off. The house needs a deep fumigation and there is no way that I'm going to do it. They know me and they know that I don't mess around with this kind of thing. I don't scare easy either. They take me seriously and they send a team. I'm still there in my truck, trying to catch my breath when they arrive to set up the tent. Trent comes over to give me a hard time, but he sees my face and the grin dissolves from his. You okay? He says. I nod. What happened? I tell him not to go inside. Just put up the tent and get it over with. He set to his work with Davis. The sun's going down when they finish setting up the place. It's going to be a long burn, they tell me. The place crawls. I'm starting to come to my senses when Trent comes over. He's got something in his hand. A bug. Found this near the stairs to the basement, he tells me, handing me the book which I see is a diary of some kind. I figured you might want to read it and see what kind of bug that was. I tell him that I don't give a crap, and I throw the book in the back of my truck. He shrugs and asks if I want a beer. I tell him that I don't feel too good. Maybe tomorrow. When I get home that night, I don't feel much better. Head's pounded and I'm kind of dizzy. 
Before I get out of the truck, though, I take the diary. Curiosity had got the better of me on the road, and by the time I pull up to my driveway, I know I gotta find out what that was. I make myself a cup of coffee, break in my no-caffeine past 1pm roll, and I settle into my chair with the bug. Now, you thought this stuff was weird before. Wait until you hear what was written inside. Here's a condensed version of what I read. February 23rd, 2020. Moving day. This place feels like home already. A lovely street, nice neighbors, trees. What more could I ask for? Notice some cool areas for photography driving the U-Haul here. It might be worth checking out a few when I'm settled in. Or if I start going crazy with all the unpacking. I think I'm really going to like it here. I get a good feeling about this place. February 26, 2020 I finally had a chance to check out that old mine today. It's so cool. I got some great photos in there. The lighting is so atmospheric. Especially with the creepy feel of it. All that broken glass and the tools strewn around. It's like the miners all just cleared out one day mid-shift. Only bad thing is the dust down there. It really set off my allergies. I couldn't stop coughing when I got out of there. I haven't had a reaction like that since I was a kid. I thought I was beyond it all to be honest. I don't even have an inhaler anymore. Anyway, it stopped now, so whatever. I guess I managed to cough most of it up. I got the feeling that these photographs could sell once I developed them. I'm gonna have a look through tomorrow and choose my favorites to work on. March 1st, 2020. I've been feeling lousy for days. The air in that mine has really done a number on me. I considered seeing the doctor here, but... I don't want to be a bother, and I still haven't switched over from the other practice, so it all just feels like too much of a hassle. I think I'll apply the old wait-and-see tactic. It usually works out. A few days of rest is all that I need, probably. I haven't even touched those photos yet. I think I'll have another nap. March 3rd, 2020 Feeling really low. My cough is pretty bad now, but I don't feel like I can leave the house. Probably too much to call the ambulance. I'm definitely not that bad, but man, I can't believe my allergies are still this bad. I'm having some other symptoms too. I feel kind of itchy. Not really itchy though. It's more like something is crawling on me, but... When I go to swat it, there's nothing there. It's such a weird feeling and it's kind of gross. If this goes on much longer. I'll go to a doctor. March 4th, 2020. I kept waking up last night. The crawling is getting worse. It feels like there are things under my skin. Under my scalp, crawling across my skull. I've been going crazy, itching myself. Torn some chunks out, digging around. Hey, the coffin has stopped at least. Guess I'm getting better. March 7th, 2020. Just woke up. I slept for 36 hours. I feel groggy still though. I'm going back to sleep. No date. I hear them in me, always moving. They talk to me. I'm home. They're home. They want more. Can't let them out. No date. Won't let me out. Hurt me. I am theirs. They are me. Shut the doors. No way out. They grow more. Holes in me. In, out. In, out. In, out. 
no date. Burn them. Me gone. Holes. Hive. From this point, the writing becomes a scrawl and then stops. I'm still not sure what to make of it all. It sounds like this guy went bonkers, right? After all that I went through last week, then reading that, I haven't really been sleeping so good. The whole experience has creeped me out. I guess I felt writing it out for you might get it out of my head. But I'm not feeling so hot myself to be honest. Even writing this has been a challenge. Probably one more day off work and I'll be right as rain. Trent called a couple of days ago. Said that they had to burn the place infestation. It was so bad. Pretty crazy. Found bones in the basement. Strewn about like he was pulled apart. He asked about the diary and I said that it's nothing. Not sure why. I just didn't feel right to tell him. Anyway, I'm pretty tired. Need a few more hours of sleep and I'll be right as rain. The wife's worried, but I keep telling her not to worry. It's bad for the baby. Thinks she's caught it a bit too. Won't be quite the pair hold up here together. Time to go to sleep. I'll feel better tomorrow. I was part of a secret operation into a disaster zone. What I saw changed my life forever. Written by T4 Bullock. On July 18th, 1995, Sufrier Hills, a dormant volcano, erupted for the first time in 600 years. It began to belch thousands of metric tons of toxic chemicals and ash onto the small island of Montserrat. If you do not know where Montserrat is, you could hardly be faulted. It is a beautiful and luxurious sandy speck in the Caribbean Sea, controlled by the British government. Or at least, it used to be beautiful. Over the following four days, the island would change forever. On July 19th, 1995, my unit was dispatched as part of an emergency rescue mission conducted by the British Royal Navy to remove civilians from harm's way. We were a small U.S. military rescue team, which remains classified for various reasons to this day. I shall not bore you with the details of bureaucratic red tape. For this story, you may call me Mr. Blue. We were highly efficient in our ability to conduct business in unorthodox circumstances. The Royal Navy requested our expertise, and we quickly mobilized. In preparation for our deployment, we had a briefing at Roosevelt Roads Naval Station in Siva, located on the far eastern coast of Puerto Rico. We were ideally placed to get to Montserrat quickly. All right, settle down, settle down. Mr. Green, our executive officer, said. He activated a screen which showed a topographical view of the island, the volcano, and our target location for our deployment for search and rescue. Mr. Green rubbed his short, cropped salt and pepper hair and gently adjusted a setting on the computer to make things easier to see. Going on another bug hunt, Commander. We haven't been to Central America in a while, Mr. Brown said. Mr. Brown was my squad leader and chief petty officer. He was a seasoned veteran of our unit, and liked to joke around at horribly inopportune times. His uniform was tailored obscenely tight at the arms, which caused his biceps to flex to the point that I thought these stitches would pop. I'm afraid not, Chief. You will be going into a hot zone. Sue Freer Hills is in imminent danger of eruption. Satellite images show a massive heat signature on the island, and roughly 6,000 people are still trapped in the capital of Montserrat, Plymouth. We are to assist the Royal Navy 
and securing as many civilians as we can for full evacuation. He tapped against the screen with a long pointer. He indicated the small city on the southern side of the island, right by the coast. I stared blankly. A rescue mission? What's the catch? We never do things this simple. Oh, no catch, Mr. Blue. The Brits have asked for assistance, and we are here to give it, like good neighbors. Turn to page three in your mission brief, Mr. Green said. Montserrat Springs Hotel is being used as a staging area for civilians to await pickup. That is where we will begin operations. As I said in the briefing, we were told the volcano had begun to discharge at Tephra, a burning hot cloud of fire onto Plymouth. The city was located just on the coast of Montserrat and nestled right against the volcano itself, and luxurious resorts and bungalows dotted the beaches. The Tephra had badly damaged the structures which surrounded Sufrier Hills. Information was limited, but most pleasure craft had already evacuated the island itself, and who was ever left had no way out. There is one more thing, Mr. Green said. HMS Broadsword detected an anomalous sound coming from the island. Her sonar operator said it sounds like massive rock collisions. It could be the volcanic activity is destabilizing the island itself. Mr. Green played the sound for us. It caused all small chatter in the room to go silent. It was a soft, baleful sound. It rumbled deep and caused the hairs on my arms to stand up. It was almost like rocks being ground together. Underwater earthquake, Mr. Red said. Oh, heck yes. It was Mr. Brown. What are you so excited about? You want to be in a volcano and an earthquake? I asked. You never seen an island sink? This will be my third. Mr. Silver, our chief petty officer and tech guru, stared wistfully at the screen. Wonder if I can get a nice picture out of that. We left from port that morning and were near Montserrat by late afternoon. The massive thunderhead produced by the intense heat and ash blotted out the sun as we made our approach. We could see the ash cloud from 40 miles away, and it was carried out to sea by the wind. It cast it an ominous image, and I couldn't help but think back to a previous mission to Mount St. Helens. Bolts of orange heat lightning streaked through the night, as Sue Freer Hills lit up the night sky with her tremendous power. All 12 men in the unit stood on the deck of the USS Port Royal, a massive Ticonderoga-class cruiser that we were more than happy to hitch a ride on. The colossal 560-foot vessel was much better than what we were used to. We often found ourselves crammed onto tiny spaces or hidden onto junks to make entry. We made landfall near a little bay and quickly unpacked our kits. We offloaded four Humvees but found them almost entirely useless. The streets were badly damaged from tremors and transit by vehicle was impossible at this point. Thick layers of ash coated the ground and formed massive gray snow drifts against buildings. Smoke covered most of these streets of the idyllic Caribbean city, though it felt more like a small town than a capital. The intense heat lightning provided out only natural illumination. The power had failed on the entry island two days earlier. We would be on foot in rough urban terrain. A small tremor, 4.5 on the Richter scale, rattled the remnants of windows and caused a small home on a hill to collapse. The Humvees rolled at a painfully slow 5 miles per hour, 
and we found several panicked civilians in a townhome near the edge of the city. Lava had begun to flow steadily from the volcano and began to ignite wooden structures ablaze. It threatened to cut the city in half, which would leave us with a compromised search area. We split up and took two Humvees each. A deep rumble could be heard as Sue Freer Hills released a massive plume of ash and soot, along with ribbon bombs of lava. Mr. Silver, Mr. Gray, Mr. Black and I went off in our Humvee closest to the lava flow to ensure that no one was trapped. Mr. Silver took multiple photos from the window. Hey, hey, stop. Mr. Silver nudged me with his hand. Not exactly the safest place to stop, I told him. In just a minute, I saw something. We pulled over and I made sure that I kept a safe distance from the small river of lava as it flowed toward the city square. We walked a short distance to the base of the volcano, and Mr. Silver knelt next to a small shrine embedded into the stone. Five bodies littered the ground around it. They were all dead, badly burned and crushed by stone. He pulled out a small camera, and it clicked repeatedly as he moved slightly and adjusted his focus. What is that thing? Mr. Gray pointed a finger at a small stone figure at the center of the shrine. It appeared to be carved from obsidian. It vaguely resembled a gorilla, with disproportionately large arms and a short, flat face. Two blunt nubs of horns atop the head. The face was barely noticeable, worn away from time. It appears to be some kind of idol or obsession. It's super old. Mr. Silver said as he replaced his camera. Sheruf? Wonder what Sheruf is? He pointed to a small etched plaque at the base of the shrine. It appeared much newer. Spanish maybe. I don't speak Spanish, Mr. Green said. Mr. Silver reached out and touched the smooth, textured statue. The ground trembled and I felt a sudden sense of unease. He grabbed it by a leg and lifted it. It immediately fell to the ground. My god, this thing weighs a ton. Mr. Silver grabbed hold with both hands and, with great trouble, hoisted it back onto its pedestal. You got your pictures, come on, let's go, I told the group. We got back in our Humvees and rolled on. We regrouped back at City Hall two hours later. The roof had caved in under the weight of the ash and dust wafted in from every direction. Mr. Black led 42 civilians towards a transport ship at Little Bay. While we checked a map with a flashlight, it marked off sections that we had already searched. What's that? Near the center of town. It's not cleared, I said. The Plymouth Catholic Church. Christ, we didn't go to the church. The lava flow had cut us off. A tremor had caused the building to groan and a massive crack formed in the floor. We have to go. This island isn't going to hold together, and I don't like to see islands sink while I'm still on them. Mr. Brown remarked. A massive rumble shook the structure, and I could hear the volcano rumble as it crept even closer to full eruption. Mr. Silver and I will go on foot. We can hike in and check it quickly, and then be back to evac, I told the group. Mr. Green gave me a stern look. 45 minutes, not a moment sooner. You will need to suit up. The air quality is just a step below toxic at this point. We donned hazmat attire and checked the airflow. I stepped out of the building into the fire. Pumice rained down on the streets as clouds of pumonite burned through my environmental suit. I found the church already surrounded by banks of ash. The sky was black, and the sun was barely a pinprick of light overhead. 
I could barely see as I made my way into the church. I stumbled into a woman as she roamed alone in a street. She kicked piles of ash and grabbed at my suit. She told me that I needed to run in the opposite direction and took off. I tried to stop her, to tell her where to go, but I could no longer see her. The deep rumble under my feet grew, and I knew I was almost out of time. A step forward in the steeple of a half-scorched church stood stoically in the dim light before me. I pushed open the door and entered. I stood inside the exquisite Catholic architecture in what soot for my mask. Dust rained from the ceiling, while the entire church was slowly shaken to its bones. I heard a small sound, barely audible. I began to walk as best as I could, down the pews until I found a small band of civilians, five in all, a family with three children. We have to go now, it isn't safe here. I shouted over the ever-growing rumble. A crack formed in the floor near the altar. The entire building groaned, and I thought that it might cave in on us if we stayed just a moment longer. I unhooked a series of long, thick yellow ropes and looped them around their waist, one at a time. I connected them with D-rings and gave each a tug. Stay close so we do not separate. I will guide you to the boats. Sheruf, the man said to me. It was almost a whisper and I barely understood it. Please, we gotta leave. Follow me. There was a strange sense of silence for a moment, and then I felt, rather than heard, a soft, low purr like a cat. It grew louder against my eardrums. I grew tense as I saw fear in the eyes of the civilians. Not good, I thought. A stream of lava burst from the floor in front of me and spurted to the ceiling, which was immediately set ablaze. Wooden beams bent and fell onto the pews. I scooped up the nearest child and began to move. I felt a hand on the rope pull slightly as they struggled to move at my pace. I saw the man carry his youngest daughter while his wife picked up their toddler son and followed, the yellow rope dangling from their waist. What I saw next shocked me for a moment. The wooden boards on the floor, burning brightly with orange flames, flaxed, bulged, bent, and finally snapped as something pushed out from underneath the structure. A geyser of lava erupted and blocked out of my view. Something was inside that lava flow. We ran out of the church and I realized it had begun to rain. Not good, I thought to myself. Rain and volcanic ash made Lahar, a dangerous combination which would bury everything around it. It moved as fast as an avalanche, but was basically boiling mud. The ground trembled beneath us as we made our way down the street as the road crumbled beneath us. I glanced up in the direction of Sufrir Hills. I could see the glow of the top of the volcano and the thick lava flows as it poured down the sides. Even though the dense ash clouds shrouded most of the area in darkness, a massive mudslide began to tumble, and the church was quickly buried in boiling black and brown sludge. We made good speed back towards City Hall, to the final Humvee and hurried everyone in. The children coughed and gagged from the noxious air, and the man fainted from exhaustion. My unit boarded the Port Royal and prepared to leave. Crewmen and women scrambled on the upper deck, and the wounded were carried below to the infirmary. As we departed from the dock, we stood in the rear deck on the Port Royal and stared in awe. A massive cloud of smoke swirled around the entire city. Plymouth was completely engulfed in ash. A figure ran out of the dust cloud onto the dock. It was a woman. 
I had seen her somewhere before. Her clothes were tattered and she was ghostly pale, from the layer of soot which blanketed her entire body. She screamed to us, begged us to turn the ship around, to come back to her. Survivor, survivor on the dock, we need to launch a Zodiac. Mr. Brown screamed towards a deckhand. What the heck? What the heck is that? I heard someone whisper. That monstrous wail, like stone being ground together, deep and guttural and earthy. It was not an earthquake. It was a roar. We stood in silence as we steamed away from Montserrat at all haste. We could still hear the roar as it was bellowed across the ocean. Bright fireballs would light up the coastline and occasionally, we would get a glimpse of the unnatural thing as it was silhouetted inside the volcanic storm. It was Mr. Green that broke the silence. Mr. Silver, your infrared camera, if you please. Already on it, Captain. Mr. Silver stared through the viewer of a high-tech camera with a lens that more resembled a telescope than something used for photographs. He snapped off dozens of images as the island faded into the horizon. Eventually, all that could be seen was the intense orange glow against the clouds. Most of the journey back to the port was silent. I wrote up a small brief to be put into a vaulted file in our headquarters in Puerto Rico. I'm sure that it'll quickly collect dust like the others. Before I did, I made sure I kept a copy of the front cover, as I do for each. Non-Biological Entity NBE-71 I Free Class Codename, Sharuv. Category 2. Location, 16 degrees, 43 north, 62 degrees, 11 west. Montserrat Exclusion Zone. Length, 27 meters. Height, 15 meters. Weight, 350 tons. Status, Active. There are some rest stops you should always avoid during road trips. Written by Weird Bryce Guy. The road trip began like any other. We sang along to popular songs on the radio, despite both of us having music app subscriptions. We ate snacks, both things we had brought and other treats acquired from gas stations and fast food restaurants along the way. We slept at motels when available, at rest stops when not, spotted cows, horses, tractors, and scarecrows, and even helped another car. Two brothers even dislodged their gaudy two-seater from a muddy ditch. It was a fun, pleasantly eventful trip. Until the final night, when everything was taken from me. I was sleeping in the back of the SUV, using a knapsack of t-shirts as a pillow, when I heard Brandon call out from outside of the car. He had gone to grab something from one of the vending machines in front of the rest stop, saying before leaving that he'd probably also sit at the bench there for a while and watch a few YouTube clips on his phone. He had forgotten his earphones and I hadn't brought mine and he didn't want to keep me up with his phones as speakers. Hearing his voice through my dreamless sleep, I awoke fairly quickly, being a habitually light sleeper, and I left the vehicle, not bothering to lock it because our car was the only one in the lot. Guided by the almost annoyingly bright lights tucked beneath the building's awning, I made my way to the open-ended corridor with the vending machines and bench. Ignoring the various stains on the concrete floor, some of which were unbelievably black but comfortingly ancient, I rounded the corner and entered the corridor, whose opposing walls held men's and women's restrooms, with the vending machines on the women's side and the bench against the men's. Beyond these was the opposite side of the rest stops and general grounds, where there were barbecue pits and large picnic tables, all of which were hidden by the darkness of the moonless night. 
I called out to Brandon and then stopped, admittedly frightening myself with how loud my voice sounded in the surprisingly echoic confines of the corridor. Assuming Brandon had simply gone into the bathroom immediately after calling me, I waited out in front of the vending machines. I hadn't been hungry earlier since I had been, you know, sleeping. But standing before the display of sugary and salty treats, I suddenly found myself craving some cookies. I withdrew a crumpled dollar from my pocket, smoothed it out on my jeans and inserted it into the cash slot, selecting a bag of cream cookies to satisfy my slightly more predominant sweet tooth. As I bent to retrieve the bag from the bottom compartment, I noticed something in the reflection of the vending machine's glass, an object beneath the bench behind me. There was something unusually familiar about the object, something that I recognized even in the grimy reflection. Turning, momentarily forsaking my stack, which had fallen in the very back of the compartment and would have required a few seconds of straining to reach it. I went to investigate the oddly familiar object, crouching and ignoring the sudden pain that accompanied the rarely utilized posture. I reached under the bench and pulled out the object. I held it in my hand and stared at it for several moments, as my brain first performed various processes of confirmation, not initially believing the stimuli fed to it by my eyes. When it finally accepted the visually fed information, it put my body into a state of immediate full-blown panic and ordered my lungs and vocal cords to project my brother's name in a voice that I barely recognized as my own, a shriek of frenzied, pleading terror. I sprang up from my crouched position, wailing my brother's name, no longer minding the sound of my own voice echoed back to me by those sallow and questionably stained walls. Without even the slightest moment of hesitation, I charged into the men's bathroom, kicked open each stall, and upon finding them all disconcertingly empty, I went out and did the same to the woman's restroom. Faced with the same awful vacancy, I returned to the hall and cried out my brother's name again, shouting it into the night which returned only my own voice, as if mocking me. Hysterical, still clutching the object that I had found, I sprinted to our car, still the only one in the lot, threw open the driver's door, tossed aside food wrappers and clothes, and pulled free our flashlight from a bag of road trip necessities. I called out again, in case he had somehow managed to make it to this side of the building, and then went back to the corridor performed one final search of both restrooms and then ran at first blindly into the area out back with the barbecue pits and tables, only turning on the flashlight after slipping on a grease stain and nearly breaking my neck. I waved the flashlight around, cutting through the shadows with the wonderfully powerful beam, going at first in a haphazard and sporadic manner, and then more methodically after finding nothing but concrete and rusted metal in the highlighted areas. Inch by inch, I searched the grounds, occasionally calling out Brandon's name when I heard a sound, even while knowing that the source was nothing more than a startled bird or heavily bodied insect. I must have spent 10 or 15 minutes searching what couldn't have been more than a concrete pavilion of 200 square feet, morbidly expecting, and a desperation-induced mania to find my brother curled up or crammed in some corner or hole. The thing I had found beneath the bench, the object that I clung to as I searched, while breathlessly croaking my brother's name, was his jaw, his bloody detached lower jaw, lips and tongue and teeth included. Without having consciously commanded my legs to make the motions, I went running into the field beyond the rest stop, the beam bobbing uselessly before me. I felt sick, physically and mentally, and practically howled my brother's name like some lunatic who had successfully escaped from an asylum. I was in those darkly traumatic moments, deranged, 
totally unhinged by shock and an all-consuming, nauseating terror. Reaching the end of the lawn, only dimly aware of the depth of my exhaustion, I cast the beam left, right, and forward, illuminating a dismal nothingness of farmland in each direction. Not wanting to stop, I turned and ran against the painful, spasm protests of my thighs, back to the sight of the rest stop, where I once again dispelled the ever-present shadows with my flashlight, and finding only the same faded and stained surface. It was only when I stopped to rest, only for a second of course, on the bench that my brain allowed me the use of its most basic cognitive abilities. I remembered, in a moment which felt almost comically profound, that I had a cell phone, and that my brother had one as well, and that I should attempt to call him, and if I couldn't reach him, then the police. After failing to dial his number three times, and then failing to stop the scroll of my contacts on his name, I vocally ordered my phone's digital assistant to call him, and then thanked her with genuine, sputtering appreciation for performing the thing that she had been programmed to do. And before I could even put my phone to my ear, I heard my brother's ringtone, the default tone of his cell phone, issuing from somewhere nearby, somewhere very close. And clutching my phone in one hand and his jaw in the other, I arose from the bench and walked with a thought-dismissing dread toward the source of the sound immediately before me. As I mentioned earlier, there were two vending machines. I had had plenty of water earlier in the night, so I hadn't even glanced at the second vending machine which held only drinks. My attention had been drawn to and immediately focused upon the machine with the snacks, which had been recently and plentifully stocked with all manner of chips and cookies, and jerkies and candies and nuts. And still, even if it hadn't been, even if there had been nothing but a solitary bag of cookies in that first vending machine, I don't think my mind would have allowed me to see the contents of the other vending machine. I simply wouldn't have been able to process it. I hadn't processed it, in my peripheral vision while standing right next to it earlier in the night. Now standing in front of the vending machine, slack-jawed and enormously horrified, my eyes scanned each item nestled behind the backwardly hooping metal rings. Just like the jaw, it took me a few moments to really process the sight, to fully, consciously accept what I was seeing. And in that interim of incredulity, I failed to notice the appearance of the stranger behind me. I only noticed his departure, seen through the eerily clear reflection of the vending machine's front surface. Eerily clear, considering the items on display behind it. To what would have been the dismay of fathers everywhere, I carelessly dropped the costly flashlight onto the concrete and picked up the thing that had been left for me by the reflectively glimpsed stranger. It was a brown plastic bag, a bit heavy, with a note duct taped to its front. Awkwardly, unwilling to let go of my brother's jaw, I upended the bag with my free hand, dumping its contents on the stain-ridden floor. Coins surged out and scattered, some rolling beneath the vending machines, others into the adjacently placed restrooms. At the bottom of the bag was an outfit, a familiar but shredded t-shirt, and an equally familiar, appallingly stained pair of pants. I held on to these, gripping them through the bottom of the bag. Incessantly, unmotively, I reread the note, I the general mass of change, and then turned again to the vending machine. I totaled the collective cost of the items, 16 in all, and then with barely any cognizance left, began gathering the requisite coins, dumbly cradling them in my trembling fist, which I had delicately relieved of the bag and its stained contents. I then rose, faced the vending machine, whose contents had been noticeably chilled by the machine's refrigeration system and inserted the 85 cents required 
for the first item in the A1 slot. I watched the item fall to the bay, stared idiotically at it for a few moments, and then turned my attention to A2. I completed this process until I had purchased every last item, and then scooped them all from the bay into the plastic bag, bringing it to the bench. I sat down, and after a moment of utter thoughtlessness, stuttered out a command to my phone's digital assistant to call the police. It was only after explaining to the emergency operator what had happened that I finally started to cry. The tears and a total presence of mind abruptly and overwhelmingly supplanting the former numbness. The note that had been affixed to the bag of coins that read, To get yourself a snack. The snacks being the various severed and torn body parts of my brother. My brother, who had been, with nightmarish inhumanity, torn apart and incorporated into the inventory of the second vending machine. When I was a detective, I learned the basement rule. Those who enter must stay. Written by Lucky Sea Vipers. How much do you value the truth? Since I was a kid, I've always thought the truth was absolute. That's why I became a detective. These days, I'm not so sure. There's a case that I can't look away from. I always come back to it, trying to get into the truth of it. But there's only one answer. The basement family case and the basement rule that came with it. The White family were the perfect happy family of four. Two parents, two kids. No one could suspect them of a thing. At least until they found a half-living teenage girl strapped to a chair in their basement. She had been in there for months. All four were taken into custody. The official investigation uncovered three more human remains hidden under the basement grounds. All children. Man doesn't seem that hard. The truth must be horrific, but simple, right? One of them did it, and some of them, maybe all of them, covered for them. An interrogation would reveal if they were all in on it or if it was just one or two members keeping it hidden from the others. If they all had the same story, well, then they were all covering for each other. Either way, we would know. Obviously, that's not what happened. None of it fits. All of the testimonies contradict each other. The whole family might be insane. And there was something else, too. There was also a fifth testimony from the girl, the victim who came through in the hospital and what she said. Well, it's not pretty at all. It's not insane in the same way as the others, which makes it so much worse. It fits perfectly, but I won't accept it. I can't. It makes everything else wrong. Can you guess what she told me? I'll let you read through them. I hope you have better luck than me. The Daughter's Testimony Detective Simmons Okay, we're going to start recording. Let's start by saying your name into the microphone. My name is Mindy White and I'm ten years old. I'm really happy to have you talking with us, Mindy. We're just going to ask you a few questions, okay? Just let me know if you need anything. I'm going to need some more of this chocolate milk when I'm done. It's very good. I'll make sure they bring all the chocolate milk you like, because you're really helping us out, Mindy. I like this flavor, because it doesn't have any blood in it. Pardon? Daddy only brings me red milk. Why does the milk have blood in it, Mindy? Mindy. 
He says that it makes me stronger. Stronger? For what? I don't really know. I guess so. I won't get hurt. Like I did before my car accident. He keeps a book hidden from the rest of us. But... Mindy, do you know why we're here? Because someone broke the basement rule. The basement rule, huh? What's that? Daddy says that little girls that go into the basement stay in the basement. I, I see. Well, someone did break the basement rule, and three children got very hurt. There's only one person who can help them. Do you know who that is? I see you're shaking your head. Mindy, that person is you. The best way to help those children is by telling the truth, which is even more important than the basement rule. Now, what did you see in your daddy's book? I don't know. What do you mean? Didn't you read it? I didn't understand it. There were a lot of bad pictures, and I don't know who Baal is. Mindy, we didn't find any book like that. Are you being honest with me? They said you wouldn't believe me. Who said that? The men who walk on my ceiling. Men who walk? I don't understand, Mindy. They come into my room every night that we have red steak. They climb up the walls and then walk around in circles on my ceiling. I don't know who they are, because they have no faces, but I know they're sad. How do you know that, Mindy? Because I can hear their tears inside my mind. That's how they told me the truth about the red steak. What's the truth? That if it comes from the basement children. I'd already figured it out though. Because cows don't have fingernails in their meat. Recording ended. Notes. Several sets of size 13 men's boot prints were found in the ceiling of the bedroom belonging to Mindy White. The Mother's Testimony Please state your name for the record. Lily. <clears throat> Lily White. Thank you, Mrs. White. I have a few questions to ask you regarding the situation at hand. What situation? I'm talking about the girl we found in your basement. The other three bodies we found underground. Does that ring a bell? Right, well, you don't need to be so rude about it. Okay, well now that we're on the same page, do you mind telling me why there was a dead girl in your basement? I don't know. What about the other bodies? I don't know. Did you know the girl, Mandy? I see you're shaking your head now, so you don't know the girl. You don't know how she got there. Do you know anything about the events that were taking place in your home? I was not aware of anything illegal taking place on my property, no. Your daughter told me that your husband gives her red milk. She said that your husband claims it makes her stronger. Do you know anything about this? My husband doesn't do anything like that. So, are you saying that Mindy is lying? Look, Mindy is a bit of a... how do I put this? A bit of an eccentric child. She has a wild imagination. She's been that way ever since her car accident. That's just how she is. So you're saying that your daughter lied? Do you really believe I would allow my husband to feed our 10 year old daughter that? Let me guess. She also told you about the men that walk on her ceiling. So I suppose she lied about the red steak. And the basement rule. Mrs. White. I don't know anything about any steak. We're a vegetarian household. Can you tell me about the basement rule? 
It's a rule that my husband enforced. Okay, and what exactly is the basement rule? I, I don't remember. You don't remember? I don't. Could you try to remember? Did it have something to do with keeping the kids out of the basement? Sorry, I have a headache. Could I get some water? Sure, I'll have someone bring you some water. While they get here though, can you please tell me a little more about your husband? Specifically, what he does in the basement? I'm not entirely sure. Mrs. White, with all due respect, do you have any idea about what goes on in your home? I just, I don't feel well. I can't think right now, I can't remember. My husband, he... He what? He's different sometimes. Different how? He talks about things. Things that never happened as if they have happened. As if I was there. He's just... Him and Mindy are alike. They're both very creative. Curious. Are you afraid of your husband? I've never been afraid of him before. Before? Before now. Before this happened. I think I fear that he might have done something. Are you saying that you think your husband could have been responsible for the bodies we found in your basement? I don't know. Maybe, maybe he messed up. I just, I don't know. I can't breathe. I think I'm going to be sick. End of recording. Note. Lily White was rushed to see a medic in a confused state after vomiting red. The son's testimony. The subject below is not to be trusted. Before the interview, police officers had to verify Ryan White's stability due to a sudden asthma attack. Medics at the time noted, incessant babbling and fidgeting as a concern over his mental state. The subject's mother gave her written approval to be interviewed by Detective Simmons. I appreciate you speaking with me. Can you state your name and age for the recording? I'm Ryan White and I'm 12 years old. Thanks, Ryan. Are you aware of what the others have said so far? About what? The sound of Ryan scratching his face makes it in. The girls. Oh, what girls? I don't know anything about any girl. I don't even like girls. They're like, gross. So you don't know anything about the bodies found? Ryan continues to scratch and pull at his skin. Not on tape, but the nails begin to leave long white marks on his face. Sorry, I'm confused. What bodies? There are no bodies. Ryan, we found the bodies. Do you know anything about it? Like dead bodies. No, sometimes we have new friends over and we play with them. But I mean, we don't really see them again. What kind of friends? How do you meet them? I think Dad introduces us. Tells us to have fun. Then they go in the basement and I get to go play video games. I love video games. There's this one. Your sister mentioned the basement rule. Can you tell me about that? I don't feel good. That's okay. Would you like some chocolate milk? No, no, I don't like milk. Why's that? Your sister loves milk. My sister hates milk. Let me guess, she also talked about the men on the walls. She only says that stuff for attention. The only things I've seen on the ceiling are shadows. Sometimes they dance. At this point, I had to stop. Not on tape, but Ryan's nails had started breaking through the skin. There was a red under his fingernails, even as he kept scratching. Okay, Ryan, thank you for your assistance. A medic. Recording ended at 1.49 p.m. The Victim's Testimony the victim is resting in a hospital bed with an IV running into the back of her hand and a bag attached to the side of the bed. There are several human bite marks covering her face and arms, one across her eye. 
Hello. I'm Detective Simmons, and I'm in charge of investigating the case involving you. I will be recording this. So, for the record, please state your name and age. My name is Mandy, and I'm 16 years old. Your full name, please. Sorry, Detective. My name is Mandy Mandy, and I'm 16 years of age. In the initial interview, her mouth didn't seem to move when I heard the second Mandy. On hearing the tape again, she only said her first name. Some other voice said the second Mandy, but there was no one else in the room. Thank you. Odd name. Now, I understand that you went through quite an ordeal, but could you please recount it for me while it's still fresh in your mind? She nods. How exactly did you come to the house? You can take your time. There's a pause on the tape. Mrs. White hired me to babysit her daughter. Can you tell me a little about what your responsibilities were? I was to do a little light housework for a few hours a day. I was to arrive at the house shortly after school let out. I sit down with Mindy and we work on our homework together while we eat a small snack. What do you feed her? We had strawberry milk. I brought a mix with me each day and some strips of beef with ketchup. Continue. After that, we would play for a couple of hours until one of her parents got home. Sometimes it was her mother, and sometimes her father. I would spend my last hour helping her pick up after ourselves and then go home. How often and long would you say you were there? I would stay for four hours three days a week. The days would vary sometimes, but most often it was Wednesday through Friday. Okay, Mandy... When we found you, it was in the basement. You were chained up and unconscious. Was there anything you can tell us about that? I don't know about the children. They were already there when he dragged me down there. When who drug you down there? I don't know, one of the family. I'd find it difficult to think someone can drag your body into the basement without giving away their identity. I went to the bathroom. One of them must have slipped something into my drink while I was away. One minute we were talking about math, and the next, I was strapped to a chair in a dark room. A sound like the scratching of a pen on paper can be heard. Can you describe the shape that you saw? A shadow with eyes. It would force speed me, and then tell me that if I didn't behave... I would end up like its friends. Its friends. I assume he was talking about the other children down there. It would often glance that way when it had talked about them. What did they feed you? Kid food. Mostly toaster treats, sometimes a nutritional bar or fruit juice. I was always thinking about ways I could escape. Do you remember anything else? No, one day the shadow figure was above me and then a door opened. The next, I woke up here. So, the mother and daughter. I never saw them. I don't know if they knew about me. The mother told my parents that I had never shown up that day, that I went missing, but that's it. Thank you for your information. Here's my card. If you remember anything, give me a call. For now, and get some rest. Can you tell my parents that I'm awake now? They may not know yet. I will tell the nurse to call them immediately. The recording ends here. The father's testimony. Mr. White sits before me. He has dark circles around his red, throbbing eyes. He doesn't look like he slept for several days. Well, Mr. White, i begun the recording. He says nothing for a very long time. Not on tape, but he stares at me all this while. Do you have any children, Detective? At this point, I paused the recording. The off-the-record exchange went somewhat like this. 
Is that intimidation? It's a question. Well, I'll be asking the questions if you don't mind. The recording resumes. Mr. Dan White, we know you killed at least three children and have kidnapped another. It's all over now. You might as well come out. We just want to know why. He says nothing for many minutes. There's no use denying it. Your family turned you in. My family must have told you a lot of strange things. They've been saying stranger and stranger things these days. About the house. About the dark. A scratching sound begins in the background of the recording. I've investigated this, but the source remains unknown. And did you know, sometimes my wife goes to my daughter's room and watches her sleep and just smiles. All mothers do that, sometimes. Not while holding a butcher knife and never with the smile she has. It's not a mother's smile. The sound of a page turning. I make a note in my notebook. So you believe your wife may have been dangerous, perhaps responsible for what we found down there. She's hiding something. You must have known that if you talk to her. She's always hiding something. The sound of his chair shifting. He leans in close to my face. Can you guess who it is yet, Detective? You must have heard it when you spoke to her. Isn't there something you missed? Is there something you're trying to tell me? More shifting. He leans back. I've been thinking about my family. It's hard to think while everything else starts to disintegrate around you. But I think I know what happened. Well then, show me. Tell me how it all fits together. My daughter... She's been saying these things, childish delusions, but lately, I've been thinking there is something else. And then my wife, she's been acting paranoid, schizophrenic, and saying, something's been creeping into her head, weighing her down. She has a secret. And my son... He had an asthma attack here, but you wouldn't let him see. He's been having breathing trouble ever since we came to this house. There's something in the air, detective. Something that goes into our lungs and makes us do and see. A gas leak, maybe. Or carbon monoxide poisoning. The sound of further scratching into paper. Man, conveniently, you would have no responsibility. And how would you explain the bodies in the basement? And the girl? Whatever you say, one of you is still a killer. Mr. White breathes in and out slowly. The scratching noise in the background seems to grow louder and more insistent. Do you have children, detective? At this point, I should have turned it off. I had no patience for intimidation tactics from a suspect, but his voice sounded so pathetic, so broken. A daughter, once. You loved your daughter, didn't you? Did you think she could ever do something bad to someone else? My daughter has childish delusions, but I'm not sure they're all delusions anymore. The bodies you found are all children, I guess. If it was children and we were sick from the air, me and my wife would have had to chase them down outside of the house, where they would be safe from the gas. It doesn't make sense. But a child could get them in. A little girl might invite her friends over for a tea party, and a child might take them down into the basement to hide from her parents and something else uh, might take over. The basement rule. I'm sorry. What were you talking about earlier on her delusion? 
It doesn't have to be a delusion. It's all part of the same story. She said I gave her red milk. She said we ate something with fingernails. When they went down into the basement, something else took over her. And something else in the shape of a little girl began eating those children in the dark. There's a pause. Do you mean to say a little child buried all of those bodies? My wife tries to hide things. You've heard her. But she only does it to protect us. She must have come down one day and... A silence follows. He doesn't say anything and I don't know what to say. Recording end. Mandy Mandy's second testimony. The victim, covered in cuts and bruises, lays in the hospital bed staring idly out the window as the IV drips fluid slowly into her veins. But she seems different this time. She's smiling. Hello again. I hope you remember me. I'm Detective Daniel Simmons, the one assigned to investigate your case. I actually had some more questions for you. Do you mind if I record our conversation again? Sure, whatever. It doesn't matter anymore. Choden's laughter is briefly heard. The suspect does not move, nor stop smiling. Thank you. I suspect this will be difficult for you, so take your time. Could you state your name and age for the record, please? My name is Mandy Mandy. The tape records multiple unidentified whispers. This is what follows. Mandy Mandy. Mandy 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 Mandy. Kill it, Mandy Mandy. I'm so hungry. And your age. My age cannot be measured by your numbering system. I'm sorry, what? No need to apologize, detective. You're not responsible for its flaws. More giggling is recorded. Well, uh, I just want to take you through the case again. You had some memory gaps. How you got down there, how you got out of there, that sort of thing. But you told us just enough to incriminate one member of the family. You see, Mr. White tried to confess to me. He thought that it was his daughter, but I noticed something odd in his logic. He assumed the children had to be friends of his kids. No mention of you, who could be within easy grasp of both parents. I also noticed that no one else mentioned a babysitter. Another thing I noticed was when you said you assumed your kidnapper was looking at the children buried in the basement. I didn't say there were children there. How did you know they were buried in the basement? Silent. She doesn't stop smiling. What really happened in that house, Miss Mandy? She didn't stop smiling. The same thing that happened before. A new family moved in with a young child. His smell came down to us below the basement grounds, where the dead sleep and we woke up. The basement is alive and watches and waits and eats your children when you're not awake. Mandy, please answer me right. What you're trying to say was that something was after the boy, not the girl. Then what caused her strange fancies? The ceiling men are the men who walk above our graves. Mindy White has been dead for two years after a car accident. She already sleeps with us in the ground. Okay, okay. This is quite the fancy you're weaving here. I understand that you went through some traumatic experiences in the basement, but you need to tell me what really happened so we can get justice for what was done to you. A dull thud can be heard on the recording. I'm sorry for slapping the table. Mandy, look at me. Her face begins to change into my daughter. Do you really think that this is anything like what happened to me? Lucy, my sweet, sweet Lucy, is it really you? 
Minty White's laugh it can be heard on the recording. Do you still think it's some fancy now, detective? Little girls who go into the basement have to stay in the basement. You shouldn't have broken the basement rule. All the dead little girls are coming out of the basement now. What the heck? Did you slip something in my drink? How did you make yourself look like my late daughter? Nurse. I think she needs to be under mental observation. She seems to be going in. Where did you go? Becky, call security. We've got a missing patient. Check cameras and see if anyone's seen her leaving the ward. A voice crackles like on a radio. Nobody has left the ward or any rooms in the past hour. Except for Detective Simmons. I'm stuck on an elevator that won't stop descending. We're 600 floors beneath the surface. Written by Mandarek. I hesitated when I saw that the elevator I was trying to get on was already occupied. More so when I saw who was occupying it. And thought that maybe uh, I should just wait for it to come back up again. Better to wait a little than go plunging to the bottom. Just because some guy couldn't keep his grubby little fingers off a burger or ten. I know I should have waited. But impatience had always been one of my vices. So I breathed a loud sigh and squeezed past the big guy onto the elevator, praying that we don't end up falling to the bottom. He at least had the good grace to look sheepish and apologize, as he saw that I was tightly packed into a corner in the back of the tiny lift. Just my luck, being tracked with Hurley from Lost on this pint-sized elevator. Headed for the ground floor, he asked. I nodded. Me too, he added, and then turned around as sweat began to pour down his face. Good. At least I won't have to reach around his large frame to try and press the button for the ground floor. The elevator creaked and groaned in discomfort as it began its descent, and I immediately grabbed the railings on its walls holding on for dear life. It made a reluctant ding sound as it passed the 10th floor. A rickety old thing, isn't it? I asked with a nervous laugh. Tell me something I don't know, he replied, equally nervous. You live here, I asked him. I've never seen you before. He shook his head. No, just a visitor. I nodded and then waited in silence for him to continue our awkward small talk, but he didn't oblige me. Not in the mood for it, apparently. You know what, it doesn't even matter. Just seven more floors to go. I wasn't going through our little journey in peace and quiet though. For soon, his arms started twitching and his right leg began to shake as we cleared floor after floor in complete silence. I saw that he was sweating heavily, and he was also breathing pretty heavily too. You okay there, buddy? I asked with trepidation. I didn't need this guy getting sick of me. No. His eyes widened, and his cheeks puffed up as he quickly covered his mouth with his hand. Oh no, I thought. Not that. He barfed all over the floor. Jesus Christ. I screamed as the liquid touched my new shoes. Sorry, he groaned, and then his body convulsed before he hurled again, projectiling on the elevator door, splashing the fifth floor through the slight crack in the middle. 
crap. How much can one guy throw up? My feet made a disgusting, squishy sound every time I tried moving. But I crinkled my nose, tightened my gut, and moved to pat him on his wet back. You okay? I asked. Yes, he coughed. I'm so sorry. Nothing like this has ever happened to me before. Life is full of new experiences, isn't it? I smiled as I helped him lean against the wall. I would find out just how true that was. Right in the next second, as the elevator stopped in its tracks, between the second and first floors, with a loud bang, the lights went out, and we were thrown into complete darkness. Great. Just what I needed. That's not good. He spoke softly. No, it isn't. What the heck happened? I took up my phone. No signal. Of course. I banged in the door angrily, before stumbling around and looking for the emergency phone. If I stayed here any longer, it's going to the contents of my stomach that will be splattered on the floor next. Help me look for the thing, I growled. Look for what? He asked, confused. The phone, man, the freaking phone, I shouted. Do you want to be stuck in here? He shrank at my loud voice, at least as much as he could, but then began helping me. We must have looked around in the dark for a solid two minutes or so, before my left hand had found it, high up on the wall. Why would anybody place it so high up? I took out the receiver and placed it next to my ear. Nothing. No dial tone. Uh, the thing's dead. I spat and slammed the thing down. They'll find us. The, the maintenance guys. He stammered. It shouldn't take too long. I nodded. Fingers crossed, huh? My nose crinkled as a vile and putrid stench assaulted my senses, overpowering the smell of the throw-up, swishing and swirling on the floor. What was that? It was nauseating, like hydrogen sulfide from a coal mine. I took out my handkerchief and put it up on my nose, trying to use it as a gas mask to protect myself from the poisonous fumes. Sorry, he spoke guiltily. I groaned. Dang this guy. He keeps discharging affluence from every orifice of his body, like a poorly regulated factory. He proceeded to prove me right by belching loudly. Mouth butt and then mouth again. Who wants to bet on what place he's going to use next? So, uh, I'm Steve, I said in a nasally voice, pinching my nose tightly. What's yours? Eh, screw it. I'll small talk the stench away. Or at least try to keep my mind off it. For I certainly didn't want to add to the poisonous cocktail brewing in this tiny little space. Oh, wow, he squeaked. What a small world. I didn't hear what he had to say, because the lights came on suddenly, and the elevator began to move again with an obnoxiously loud moan. I breathed a sigh of relief. Just a couple of floors to go. We watched in tense silence as the elevator gradually made its way downstairs. The soft dinging reminding us that we had descended a floor, and then another. Ah, uh, ground floor. I stood up straight, preparing to find the exit of this pigsty, when the elevator lurched and moved downwards once again. Oh, crab. You pressed the button for the ground floor, right? I asked skeptically. 
Yeah, uh, I swear I did. He replied defensively. I looked at the button panel. None of the buttons were lit up. I rolled my eyes. Of course, he didn't press it correctly. Now we're gonna go all the way down to the end of the basement parking, three floors down, before we can come up again. Screw that. I decided to leave the elevator and use these stairs to come back up again. No way was I spending a second more than I had to in this place. I coughed and my eyes began to water as the smell got worse. I'm really sorry, man, he began. It's okay. I cut him off sharply. Just stop talking, please. Ding. 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 We had finally reached the bottom of this building. Finally, this ordeal comes to an end. I smiled a little, as I imagined the reaction of the person waiting for us on the other side. That kid from The Shining, seeing the twin sisters and a flood of crimson come gushing at him, had a better experience than what awaits this person. To my utter shock, the elevator didn't stop. It kept on descending. What the heck? I yelled. Maybe there is another basement, he offered. Or maybe they installed another one. You just can't build another basement, you idiot. I screamed. Well, you can. It's just very expensive, he pointed out. In a freaking apartment building, without the residents finding out. I lifted him incredulously. His head was thicker than his body. That can't be good, he said, his voice showing fear now. I looked at the display panel. It was showing negative five this time, and we were still descending. I could feel the hair on my arm stand up as I realized that we were officially in the freaking twilight zone right now. What in the ever-loving heck? You think it's a glitch? He asked. My breath quickened in anger, frustration, and fear. A glitch? Really? The machinery got a little messed up and out of place, so it decided to dig into the ground and drag us to the center of the earth, right? Can't you feel the elevator moving? There is no glitch. The elevator continued to pick up speed, clearing floor after floor at a rapid pace now. My heart began to pound with sweat pouring down my brow. As I held onto the railing, so tightly my knuckles were turning white. Oh God, oh God, oh God, he whimpered. I don't want to die. I closed my eyes shut, clenched my teeth, and waited for all of this, whatever it was, to end. The elevator began shaking violently, and I feared it would break apart, sending us falling down to whatever fate had in store for us down there. I felt a sharp pain in my sides as he fell onto me, and the railing painfully dug into my ribs. Three more dings. The numbers were going by in the blink of an eye as we traveled at the speed of a monorail. I pushed him aside, taking in deep breaths as my lungs expanded in relief. I then got down and curled up into a corner, the vomit staining my clothing. But I wasn't even paying attention to that, as my fear had long overridden my disgust. The lift slowed down with a jerk, but it didn't stop moving. I opened my eyes slowly, and I looked around. Negative 100. I froze when I saw that number. How deep were we? How is this even possible? 
I rubbed my eyes and I looked at it again. Yup, we were 100 floors down, and this thing was still moving. I'd always considered myself to be a non-believer, but that was fast changing now. I began sobbing like a baby, a grown man bawling loudly. Please, uh, let this end. When I saw him, I right about peed myself. He was sitting on the floor to my right, staring off into the distance lifelessly. Shivers ran down my spine as I realized that he might have died. Stealing my nerves, I waded through the liquid and crawled over to him, mindful of the dinging as we kept on moving downwards. No pulse. No heartbeat. He was gone. Was it the shock that got him? I don't know. But I knew that my sole companion was now dead, and that I was trapped in an ever-descending elevator with a body. I put my head in my hands, pulled my hair, and began crying harder. You must be thinking that it couldn't get any worse than that, right? Mo it did. It escalated beyond my imagination as the body's hand shot out and caught my arm in a vice-like grip. I screamed in fright and then began shaking my arm violently to free myself. But he was way too strong. His face was trembling, his pupils dancing around in his eyes erratically. I watched in terrifying silence as his tongue flopped out and hung loosely on his chin as his head kept on shaking. I put my legs against the walls and pushed, trying to use the recoil to free myself but to no avail. His cheeks began to puff up, his arms swelled and I finally freed myself, crashing into the opposite wall. Ding. Negative 150. I looked at him in fascination. Was he growing bigger or were my eyes deceiving me? No, I wasn't wrong. He was blowing up like a balloon, growing larger and larger, his head hitting the ceiling gently. Oh no, how much bigger was he going to get? I jumped to the corner farthest from him as he kept on expanding, covering more and more of the left. Soon, his bulging stomach pressed against my body, and I took a deep breath, not knowing when I'll get the chance to breathe again, if at all. I felt myself fading away as the pressure got worse and worse, and the last thought I had was what a strange way to die this was. The next thing I remember is tasting coppery liquid on my tongue. I spat the offending substance out, and tried to open my eyes. Almost immediately, the pain in my head started to register. It was pulsating like someone was beating on my skull with a hammer. I blinked my eyes open and cleared my vision. My heart sank and I realized I was still in the elevator which was still moving downwards. And I was lying in a pool of red. Whose? I turned my head around and a sharp pain shot up through my neck, making me regret trying to move. Ding. Holy crap. Everything was covered. The floor, the walls, the ceiling. It looked like something had exploded here, like a giant balloon of red. I almost threw up when I thought what that something could be. My suspicions were confirmed when I saw what looked like intestines hanging from the tiny fan embedded in the ceiling. Those weren't the only traces left of him. I noticed other parts, some floating in the now ankle-deep pool of liquid. This was when I lost control over my guts and added to the little art installation at my feet. Not knowing what else to do, I tried using the phone again after I had calmed down a bit, but it still seemed not to be working, and I had almost put it back down when I heard it. This soft, gentle crying that was somehow the scariest thing this night. Even worse than everything that had happened until now. 
The voice was barely audible, as if coming from a large distance, yet it felt like it was right next to my ears. Clear as day, the strange contradiction threatening to rip my mind apart. It was a weeping baby, crying out for God knows what, the sound shredding my soul to pieces. What was that? I wanted to put the phone down and run as far away as possible, but I stood rooted to the spot as the same sound replayed again and again, as if on a loop. I felt something tugging at my pants. I looked down and saw the baby with an abnormally large head trying to crawl up my leg. His mouth opened and I heard it crying, but it was strange because the crying was coming from the phone and not this thing hanging from my shin. Have you ever been so terrified that your body just shuts down and refuses to listen to the commands your brain is desperately screaming at it? Because that is how I felt at that moment. I couldn't do anything as it crawled all the way up to my knees. It snarled, its face deforming into a hateful expression and the spell was broken with my fight or flight response kicking in. I shook my leg frantically trying to get it off of me. Finally the thing slid off, letting out a painful, low pitched, almost demonic cry. I hesitated before I walked over to that thing full of rage and finally shook it off of me throwing it into the wall. I collapsed onto my knees and cried once again. My heart was thumping and my hands and legs were shaking like crazy. It felt like I was going to come apart. Why, why, why like this? I don't know why this is happening to me or when this is going to end, if at all. I just felt the need to write this down, to have someone know what exactly I've gone through. I don't even know if this is going to show up or not, but I know that I have to try. Because I have a feeling I won't be able to contact anyone ever again. As this elevator is soon going to reach floor 666. I was forced to work at a millionaire zoo of anomalies. I found a list of rules to follow. Written by Alpha Cryptid. My name is Sammy. I am a 17-year-old high school student. I was privileged enough to be born into a family with no problems, financial or otherwise. I never felt the need to earn any money. Until the age of 17, you see. All my friends had one part-time job or another. And they used the money that they earned to buy stuff for themselves and learn a thing or two about work ethics. So, because of some peer pressure and the fact that I hadn't had a job until now, I started searching for one. I wanted a job with decent pay, just so that I could earn a respectable income for a high schooler and spend some money on games without having to pester my dad every month or so. Luckily, I stumbled upon a job offer on Craigslist. It read, Position open for a night security guard at Redacted's private zoo. Earn $150 a night. Work 6 hours a day. 12 a.m. to 6 a.m. The person applying should be 20 or younger for reasons that will be specified. You will have to sign an NDA, a non-disclosure agreement. The ad was run by some millionaire to find a guard for his private zoo or whatever the place he kept his exotic animals he called. I called up the number given on the advertisement and a male voice answered the call. He introduced himself as Gordon. He interviewed me over the phone, but he asked some weird questions. Are you frightened by loud sounds? What is your height? What is your age? Can you follow instructions and rules to the T? 
After answering all the questions, honestly, he told me that I was hired. I asked him why he was asking all of these questions, but he said, You will know when you reach the site. He asked me to fill out an online form, which I did. The form asked for the applicant's address, full name, phone number, and other such information. Obviously, I was suspicious, so I asked him more about the zoo, but I wouldn't talk about it. I finally told him I was not willing to work at a shady place, and I started looking for other jobs, but found none of them too appealing. I contemplated about taking a job at the zoo until 2 a.m., but then eventually I just went to sleep. I woke up groggily to find that I was not in my house, but was in an unfamiliar room. There was a watch on my wrist, which displayed the time, my heart rate, and my lifeline. I got out of the bed and I looked around the room. Everything was white. The bed, the closet next to the bed, the door, all the walls, the rug, the table, and the chair. I opened the door which was already unlocked to see a long road with cages on both sides. I left the room and I saw a giant tiger-like creature in one of the cages. It was giant approximately 15 to 20 feet in length and at least 6 to 7 feet tall and was a light green color. It let out a loud, ground-shaking roar when it saw me approach the cage. Prototype 1 Maxis Maxis is a genetically mutated Bengal tiger, one of the millionaire's name omitted favorite pets. It has a deafening roar, and the body strength is six times more than that of its original counterpart. It is 17 feet from snout to tail, and is four to five times heavier. And before I could even read its description, it let out another roar, but this time, the roar was so loud that my ears started hurting and I ran back inside the room in which I had woke up in. I noticed a piece of paper kept on the table with a set of what appeared to be headphones. I picked up the piece of paper. It read, Hello, new employee. First, let me clear up any confusion. Yes, you will be getting paid. And no, we are not trapping you in here forever. You'll just be brought here every day between 12 a.m. and 6 a.m. And a shape-shifting entity will take your place for that time. There is no point in going anywhere. Don't go to the police. Don't tell this to your parents because, frankly, no one will believe you. Just follow this list of rules to survive and prevent any creature from escaping. Rule number one. Wear the headphones at all times. They will cancel out all the deafening noises and sounds. Conduct a check of all the 12 creatures at least every one hour. Failing to do this will automatically cause all the cages to open. So don't say you hadn't been warned. Rule number two. While conducting your round, if Prototype 10, Stygian, starts screaming and bashing up the cage, run inside of your room, lock it from the inside, and turn on all the lights. It will only be able to harm you in a dimly lit or dark environment. Rule number three. If you see another person walking inside of the zoo, shoot him. There is a pistol in the drawer beside your bed. This was not mentioned earlier because it is futile against every single entity present here, except this one. 
Failing to do this within two minutes of seeing him will cause your whole body to seize up and paralyze. You will feel every stroke of the knife, then he will take your skin and do unspeakable things before eating you. You'll be helpless and will have to watch the whole ordeal with your own eyes. Rule number four. If the alarms start going off, it means a prototype entity has escaped. If this happens, open prototype one's Maxis his cage using the button in your room under your bed and he will take care of the rest. To get Maxis back inside his cage, take the barrel kept inside your closet and throw it in his enclosure. He will run inside to find the source of the smell of beef. Then press the button under your bed once again to seal his enclosure. Rule number five. If Maxis loses the battle between him and any other prototype and yourself, Maxis is your only friend in this private zoo and they are especially hostile towards humans. Rule number six. The advantage of being younger than 20 is the fact that they will be easy on you if they get their hands on you. It is seen in every prototype's behavior that they are more angry and aggressive towards older people. Rule number seven. If while conducting your round, you see prototype fives named magenta, gills turn blue instead of their usual red color, and she looks in your eyes. Look away as fast as you can and put the headphones on. She is going to sing a song, which will cause you to be enchanted and help her out of that cage, where she will devour you and let loose all the other prototypes. She is the most cunning and witty one. Rule number eight. Do not go to sleep during your shift, or you'll wake up in one of the cages with any one of the prototypes. Just hope you end up in a cage with the comparatively harmless ones like Prototype 1 or Prototype 11, Talon, the bipedal wolf-like creature that can fly. They will give you a death marginally less gruesome. Rule number 9. The other prototypes will not give you major problems, but if you smell a foul stench, like that of garbage or decaying fish. Follow it. Enter the cage of the prototype from where the odor is coming and look the entity straight in the eyes. All of them can sense fear, so no matter how much they try to charge at you, do not flinch. They will not hurt you if you aren't scared of them. Then exit the enclosure after the smell has ceased. Rule number 10. Every morning at 6 a.m., you'll pass out and wake up in your bed with the $150 in your pocket. This will continue until you turn 20, and after that, we will leave you alone. As I finished reading the note, I sensed a foul scent coming from outside of my room. I followed it. It led me straight to the enclosure of Prototype 8. I looked at its description. It read, Prototype 8, Grosh. Grosh is a black-colored bird of prey with a wingspan of 23 feet and 10 inches and a height of 7 feet and 6 inches. Its talons are 11 inches each the sound of its deafening screech causes temporary paralysis. It cannot cause any physical damage to you if it's locked in its enclosure, but if it gets let out of its cage, it can cause changes in the climate around it, and then it can control the elements of fire and lightning. If you enter its cage, your best bet to survive is to look straight into its eyes. 
but that would be hard because you will be paralyzed from the neck down. The door of the cage was already unlocked. I entered it. The creature immediately noticed my presence. It looked evil, almost demonic. It has a giant beak, big enough that it could swallow a rabbit hole. It started flapping its wings. That caused even the tallest and strongest trees to sway. It was twice or thrice the intensity of a giant chopper landing. It looked at me and what appeared to be an evil smile formed across its grotesque face. It let out a deafening screech. But luckily, I had my headphones on. But still, I could hear his screech loud and clear. My legs started twitching and I fell to the ground. With its eyes fixated on me, it started flying. It went all around the enclosure, but it never looked away from me. I could see shadowy figures in my peripheral vision. But something in me knew... It was just an attempt by the morbid creature to make me look away. After what felt like an eternity, it screeched once more and made a dive towards me. Now in another other case, I would obviously have flinched. But to this day, I thank my lucky stars that I was paralyzed and knew that the bird couldn't harm me. After I did not flinch, the bird quickly lost interest, and the odor was now gone. I got up and literally ran out of the cage, closing the door behind me, which locked on its own. After this near-death experience, nothing major happened that night, except Prototype 5, Magenta's Gills Turning Blue, during which I followed Rule Number 7. The next morning, I had a long talk with Gordon about what the heck was happening. I promised him another heavily built teenager in exchange of me, but he didn't listen. I had recorded the entire call to use as evidence against him, but when I checked my recordings, it was somehow not there. So here I am, standing on the rooftop of an apartment, contemplating what to do next. I just know that I can't go back to that place. I'm using this as a log and as a warning for people not to attempt jobs from shady websites. I know there are most people like me working the other three six hour shifts that have my best wishes and to the person who is going to take my place. I'm sorry. I used to work for Blockbuster, The Experience that Ruined My Life, written by Epa Deluxe. I used to work as a cashier at Blockbuster, you know, the video rental place that went out of business a long time ago. A lot of people have fond memories of trips to Blockbuster. Everyone likes to say that there was something special about going there. Something about walking down the aisles on a Friday night, scouring the shelves for the perfect movie for the weekend. You couldn't plop down at your TV and have hundreds of movies at your fingertips like today. You had to get in the car and drive down to Blockbuster. But they can never pinpoint any solid reason as to why it was so great. I figure it's nostalgia rearing its head as it tends to do for people. Still, they speak so fondly of their experiences going there, as if it was something magical. I do remember being awed by the sheer amount of movies the first time I entered the store, but that memory has mostly faded away, replaced by sheer horror whenever I think back to my time there. The place still gives me nightmares. At the time I worked at Blockbuster, I was only 19 years old. I still lived with my parents, despite the ribbon I got from some of my buddies, who had packed their bags and headed off to different universities. Most of them flunked out anyway, but even if I would have flunked out too, 
I think I would have turned out better. I guess you could say that at the time. I was pretty unmotivated, lazy even. I didn't have much of a plan or idea of what my future was going to be. I was taking it one day at a time and trying to enjoy my life with my only real thoughts, being which girl I would ask out or where I could buy a bit of weed. My responsibilities at the time were to basically hold down a job so I could have a bit of spending money. And so, I ended up at Blockbuster as a cashier. It certainly wasn't a glamorous job, but there were worse places to work. I started out working a second shift with another guy. He was a bit older than me, but he was cool and he showed me the robes. He taught me how to use the cash register, told me my duties, made sure everything was going alright. You know, just the usual stuff when you start a new job. It was all pretty simple stuff and it didn't take long for me to become accustomed to working there. You had your bad customers, the guys who would get angry at you because the movie they wanted wasn't there, or the guy who didn't want to pay his late fees. But overall, most people were pleasant. The evenings were always pretty busy with people stopping by to pick up a movie after work. It was always lively, and to be honest, the time seemed to fly by. Most nights were a breeze with enough customers to pass the time without being overwhelmed. But Friday nights were almost always a hellish scramble trying to assist all the customers in a timely manner. It felt like half the town would converge on our local blockbuster, hungry for movies to watch over the weekend. Families would pour in with their frenzied kids eager to rent some movies. Now, I didn't really dislike kids until... I saw the worst of them at Blockbuster. They would invariably scream or throw a tantrum when the movie or video game they wanted was out of stock. They always demanded candy or snacks, and none of them would leave the store happy unless they got two rentals, when their parents only wished to pay for one. I had worked there for about three months when my manager, Mr. Evans, approached me about potentially moving to the graveyard shift. Mr. Evans told me that the typical night shift guy had quit, and that he was having a tough time filling the position. Since I was young and didn't have too many responsibilities, he of course thought that I was the perfect candidate. I wasn't especially keen on the idea, until he mentioned a nice pay raise. I couldn't resist even a little bit more money. Despite my reservations, I figured it would be a change of pace from the busy evenings and the terror of these screaming children. I had heard a few rumors of creepy customers coming in at night and that gave me pause, but in the end, I decided that it wasn't worth worrying about and accepted the position. My first night in the graveyard shift, I was actually feeling a little nervous. The sun had gone down and I drove in the pitch dark of night to get to the usual shopping center. I had never seen the shopping center so dead. The parking lot was nearly empty at this hour with most of these surrounding stores having closed about an hour earlier. I showed up about 5 minutes before my start time and found the vibe of the store completely different. The lively sounds of kids arguing over movies and people scrambling to get the newest releases were instead replaced with the quiet shuffling of the remaining customers as they walked out the door. It was a bit eerie to have the place so quiet but I guess and that's what I signed up for. Mr. Evans greeted me and explained he was going to be spending the first night with me. I felt a little relieved that I wasn't going to be alone, but also disappointed that it was going to be with the one person at the store I could barely stand. Mr. Evans was a bit of a hardo, who didn't like anyone having a spare moment to breathe. You're not paid to stand around, was his favorite line. I'm sure most people know the type. He explained to me in a harsh tone that it's best to try to keep busy to keep the clock ticking. He suggested a list of menial tasks like taking inventory, or checking movies for signs of damage, or checking how many late movies there were so we could assess a fee. I say suggested, but even I could read between the lines that what he really meant was, 
Have all that done before morning, or you're going to hear about it. As my eyes were beginning to glaze over from the checklist of tasks he was sacking me with, he started walking towards the front of the store, waving his hand to signal me to follow. He led me behind the counter to where the cash register was before stopping and turning back towards me. He let out a brief sigh as if he didn't want to tell me what he was about to, but he had to get it over with. Now, we've never had any problems here, but being that you are working at night, there is always a small chance that someone could try to rob the place. I'm not trying to scare you, and this is all in the very rare chance that it does happen. I nodded my head and listened intently as he continued to speak. I was wide awake now as he squatted down to look under the counter. I bent over to look under the counter as he pointed his finger at a small black button. This button here is only to be pushed in an emergency. You can reach your hand under there and push it discreetly in case you need help. It will automatically send a signal to the police, and someone will be on their way, he said. I had never stopped to consider a robbery, and I had never been told about the button before. But I guess if I was to be alone, that I should know about it. Still, the idea of being held up at gunpoint didn't sit well with me, and I briefly asked myself if I had made the right choice taking the move to this new shift. Nevertheless, I nodded to the manager and told him that I understood, before he stood up with a grunt, holding a single hand on his lower back. He returned to showing me more ordinary tasks and the rest of the night ended up going pretty quick. It took me about a week to settle into my new position. I had to get used to the typically barren store and the boredom that came with it. The music that repeated itself several times per night over the store's speaker system didn't help with making things any easier. I found myself fighting to stay awake, sometimes walking down the aisles in an attempt to keep myself energized. The worst thing was how creepy it felt at times to be alone in the store. With it being dark outside, I always found it a little scary. I wasn't a chicken or anything, but being the only building that is still open in the middle of the night felt strange. The store had a habit of creaking or groaning too. You couldn't hear these noises during the day, but in an empty store, they seemed as loud as fireworks. I would feel relief when I saw the sun coming up, and not only because my shift was ending, even when I got used to the shift, I was always a little on edge. I would often hope that the door would open and a customer would walk in so I could be sure that there was still life outside of my small space at Blockbuster. I could pass some time assisting the customer, and often we would chit chat about movies, but those situations were few and far between. I began to wonder if it was even profitable to have the place open at night considering so few people showed up. I started to spend my time doing those menial tasks that Mr. Evans had given me. Occasionally, I would browse the vast collection of movies to see if there were anything that I'd be interested in. It was only a job, I told myself. And so, the days passed. There eventually came a night where something really strange had happened. It was about 2 in the morning when a bald-headed man had walked into the store. As I said, I'm usually excited to see a customer, but this one was a bit different. Something about his head seemed odd. He was bald, but usually, you can see some hint of hair growing in somewhere. But this guy's head was completely bald, shining and everything. I could swear that his head was also a little too perfectly shaped. He was dressed in a grey jumpsuit with boos, which again, I thought was odd. I chalked it up to him being some sort of maintenance man stopping in after one of his shifts. I greeted the man as he walked in, but he brushed past me and went down one of the aisles without a word. So much for being friendly, I thought to myself. I watched him carefully as he seemed to wander the store aimlessly. He did this for about five minutes never seeming to stop to actually pick up a movie or even look at the cases. It was at this point that I was beginning to get a little weirded out. The little voice in the back of my head was telling me that something was amiss. 
My eyes started to move, wanting to position myself behind the counter, just in case this guy was up to no good. But after about 15 minutes, the man continued to walk in a pattern around the store, down the horror section and then past the comedies and back up past the romance movies. I finally found the courage to speak up. This was all too weird for me. I came out from behind the counter and approached the man as he was doing his seventh lap past the comedies. Sir, can I help you find anything? I said with a meek voice. The man stopped in his tracks and I instantly had goosebumps. His head turned towards me this time but slowly, almost robotically. His eyes were a dull gray color but they looked almost glass-like. And his face again, it appeared a little too symmetrical. Too perfect. There was a sort of sheen to the skin on his face. Something was not right with this guy. Call it gut instinct or a sixth sense or whatever you like, but I had a bad feeling about him. He looked at me for a few seconds. Those glassy eyes seemed to be scanning me. And then he turned around and continued walking. I didn't know what to do. I headed back beyond the counter and pondered whether I should phone my manager or maybe even the cops. The man was freaking me out, but he hadn't actually done anything wrong. I don't think my manager would be too happy to be awoken in the middle of the night because a strange man was wandering the store. So I decided to do nothing, and by this point, the man had stopped walking and was now standing in the far corner facing a row of movies. I felt relieved for a moment, thinking that he would choose a movie and get out of here. But he didn't. He just stood there like a statue for about another ten minutes. My heart was racing, unsure of what to do, when I heard the sound of the door opening to my left. I saw two men enter the store. Both were well-groomed and dressed in suits. One of them wore sunglasses, despite it being the middle of the night. The one man nodded at me, and I returned the gesture absentmindedly. The night just got even weirder, I thought. The two men in suits headed directly for the bald-headed man who still stood in place. They both took position on opposite sides of the man, each grabbing one of his arms, and then began to drag him forcibly from the store. Was I witnessing a kidnapping? I didn't know what to think at that point. The bald-headed man didn't even scream or protest. He didn't even struggle. He only had a blank look on his face. I watched in silence as they dragged him out of the door and put him in a car. The whole thing was less than a minute. I once again pondered whether I should call the cops or someone. My heart was pounding after those events. But being a dumb teenager, I decided it was best to keep quiet. I finished out the rest of my night, but I was on edge, even more so than usual. Many creaker sounds had me jumping, and I was even afraid of customers entering the building. I contemplated closing the store, getting into my car and leaving, but I didn't. I carried on with the next few nights as things returned to normal. I was beginning to feel less afraid, but I never told anyone about the strange man or the kidnapping, or whatever I saw. One night, Mr. Evans showed up out of the blue. He told me to do my normal duties, and that he would be sticking around to do paperwork in the back room. It was about halfway through my shift when I heard the door opening and a customer begin to walk in. My heart sank as I saw the same bald-headed man walk into the store. I immediately felt a tinge of fear creep into me, but I was reassured by the fact that my manager was in the back if I needed help. The man again began pacing around the place as I watched in silence. I didn't even try to greet him this time. I guess he had survived his kidnapping or whatever that was. He took the same exact route around the store as he did before, but after a few minutes, something must have changed. He stopped in place in the middle of the store and stood there with his back towards me. I was starting to feel creeped out again. I can't pinpoint what terrified me so much, but this guy was bizarre to say the least. His erratic movements and the way he would stop in place and stand there with no purpose to it left me feeling tense. 
I debated going back to get my manager, but then I saw something that horrified me even more. The back of the man's neck had what appeared to be a barcode on it. Was it some sort of tattoo? I didn't have time to really think about the implications of that as the man turned and approached the counter. His movement had now transformed into a stilted mechanical gait as he crept towards me. His dead eyes peered at me. His emotion in this face revealed nothing of his intentions. It took everything I had to not run out of the building in that moment. Hunger, the man said as he came ever closer to the counter. His voice was unnatural, too tinny, too high-pitched. Alarm bells were going off in my brain, telling me to get the heck out of there. But again, I didn't. I stood behind the counter until the man stood before me on the other side. Our eyes met for a moment, but I couldn't hold eye contact. Something about his eyes, uh, they weren't right. I couldn't see any sense of human warmth within them. Hunger, he repeated. Uh, I could only stutter out a short reply. Well, we have some snacks that you can buy, I said, gesturing towards the shelf filled with candy and chips. A spark of nervousness was evident in my voice. Hunger, he said again. At this point, I had had enough. I didn't stick around any longer than that. I ran out from behind the counter towards the back room to find my manager. The bald-headed man didn't move from his position. When I reached the back room, I found my manager going through a stack of papers. I was sweating at this point. My face was flushed. The manager looked at me as if I was crazy. Is there a problem? He asked. There's a weird guy here. He keeps saying something about hunger. I tried to talk to him, but he only keeps saying how hungry he is. I spotted out. My manager shot me a peculiar grin and raised his eyebrow. The guy's probably on drugs. I'll handle this. My manager said, getting up from his desk. For a few seconds, I felt relieved that I wouldn't have to deal with the man any longer. I followed Mr. Evans out of the room and towards the man. He was still standing at the counter repeating the word, hunger, every few seconds. Mr. Evans turned and gave me a look like he didn't believe it, as if to say, what the heck, without actually saying those words. I could see a hint of concern in his eyes too now. I think we both instinctively knew that this was far from normal. We should have trusted our instincts and gotten the heck out of there, but instead, we tried to fulfill our job duties. Sir, if you're hungry, there are plenty of snacks here you can purchase. And there's a diner down the street that is still open. And they make a great club sandwich, Mr. Evans said, trying to be cordial. He had that typical smile he had when dealing with customers. The man only stood still, repeating hunger over and over again. My manager stood there baffled, his smile slowly fading away into a scowl. Even he wasn't sure what to do at this point. I'm going to have to ask you to leave, Mr. Evans said sternly, but the man didn't move, only kept repeating the same word over and over. It was growing more rapid now. The pitch of his voice grew a little deeper, and it seemed to be more distorted each time he said it. I had positioned myself behind the counter once again. I had a feeling that this was going to go sideways, but hoped that Mr. Evans could take care of the situation. I could see his face going red now. He was going to explode. Hey, did you not hear me? I said get the... My manager didn't even get to finish his sentence when the bald-headed man grabbed his arms around the bicep and then squeezed. He began pushing his arms inward, pinning my manager's arms against his own body. Mr. Evans yelled and howled struggling to escape the bald man's grasp, but he couldn't. I immediately pushed the black button. I knew the police would be on their way, but how long would that take? I didn't know whether to run from the building or try to help Mr. Evans escape. In the end, 
I stood rooted to the ground and watched in horror as the struggle continued. Everything seemed to be happening so fast, and I was powerless to do anything. The bald man began to open his mouth, but where a human would have a limit to how far they could open their mouth, this man apparently did not. His jaw began to stretch to inhuman levels as his face cracked and started to fall apart. Underneath was not red or muscle or bone, but some sort of gray synthetic material covered in a white foam. The thing's jaw continued to expand, growing larger and larger. What was once a human head had begun to fall apart as the thing's jaw grew. The nose cracked and it fell to the ground, followed by the thing's eyes. There were wet plopping sounds as pieces of skin and nose and its eyes fell to the ground. White foam began leaking onto the ground, filling the floor with the substance until it seemed it was up to their ankles. It bubbled and churned like it was undergoing some sort of chemical reaction. It smelled like some sort of cleaning chemical that made me want to pass out. My brain went blank, and I found that all I could do was scream at the horrific sight as the mouth of the thing grew ever larger. A massive black void with human-looking teeth dotting the outskirts. I screamed along with Mr. Evans, until our screams had begun to sound like a demented chorus. He was doing everything he could to escape, wriggling his body as best he could, swinging his head from side to side, trying to kick his legs but it wasn't good enough. The thing had an ironclad grip on him. I began to pick up movie cases, candy, a small bell, anything that I could get my hands on. I lobbed the items at the thing from behind the counter hoping that he would stop and release Mr. Evans. There was no effect. Even solid hits did not seem to faze him, and the terror continued. All the while, Mr. Evans did not seem to be able to hold on much longer. The thing's ears began to leak that same white foam as the mouth grew larger. Eventually, they fell to the floor. There was no longer a phase. I wouldn't even call it a head anymore. It was now a collaboration of that strange material and a massive mouth, outlined by teeth ready to devour whatever it wished. I knew that I had to try to help in any way that I could. I didn't like Mr. Evans, but there was no way I was going to leave him to fight against this thing while I stood by and watched. I only had two options at that point. I could run out the door like a coward, or I could stand and help Mr. Evans. I chose the latter. I tried my best to mentally prepare myself for what I was going to do. My body trembled, but I mustered all the courage I had and I leaped over the counter to confront the monster. I charged towards the thing with a lion's roar, putting all my power into a shoulder slam. I connected with enough force that the thing staggered back a few feet, releasing its grip on Mr. Evans in the process. My shoulders stung from hitting him. Whatever material made up this thing, it was clearly tougher than any ordinary human body. To my dismay, the thing was able to remain on its feet. Its mouth had seemed to teeter back and forth as it recovered from the force of the impact. White foam gurgled out of the gigantic mouth as it turned its attention towards me. Mr. Evans had fallen to the ground. He was clearly injured in some way. He clutched at his ribs as if in extreme pain, but still, he tried to crawl across the floor towards the door. I thought that I could buy him some more time if I hit the thing again. I charged at the monster again, intending to tackle him to the floor. When I reached the thing and my body made contact with it, it was like I had run into a steel wall. Pain shot through my shoulder and down through my body. The thing didn't budge this time, not even an inch. The adrenaline that I had a moment ago had completely dissipated, and it was instead replaced by extreme fear. I tried to turn and run, but his hand reached out towards me and wrapped around my neck. It was hard to breathe almost immediately. The pressure on my throat tightened, and I was gasping for the tiniest bit of air. I swung one of my arms in a frantic play to try to free myself, but this was a huge mistake. 
I realized almost as soon as I had swung that this was not a great idea. But when you're in a panic, you do dumb things. Everything was in slow motion as I saw the thing's mouth had shift into place, so that a good part of my arm sank right into the thing's mouth. There was nothing left I could do at that point. I tried to scream, but I couldn't. I felt a sharp pain in my arm, as its teeth sank down into my flesh, piercing through muscle and then through my bone. When I pulled my arm back, I was missing most of it. What remained in my arm was a horrific stump that spurted red. I felt my vision blackening as I saw it. I couldn't breathe. I began to tell myself that this was the end. That was when the thing suddenly tossed me like a rag doll into one of these central display shelves. I felt the back of my head hit a part of the metal shelf as well as the large part of my back. The shelf tipped over as I went along with it, crashing to the floor with a heavy thud. Movie cases fell to the ground along with me, and I could see red begin to pool around the floor. Red filled my left eye as I realized my head was now bleeding as well. I could barely move my body at this point. My back had been injured and it hurt to move. I clutched at what remained in my arm, trying my best to stifle the intense bleeding. I saw stars for a moment but I was able to regain my breath and look over to see the thing heading for Mr. Evans again, who had not made it too far. The only thought that ran through my head at the moment was, you tried, you tried, as the thing picked up Mr. Evans once again, and resumed what I had interrupted. I was completely defeated. Mr. Evans shrieked as the thing pulled him up off the ground. It began to squeeze his arms into his body the same way that it had before. I could see through my hazy vision that Mr. Evans looked over at me in a desperate plea for some sort of help. But no one could help us at this point, and I heard the bones in his arms finally give way with a loud, cracking sound. The thing continued to push his arms inward, and Mr. Evans let out one last howl before I heard the final cracking of his ribs too. I saw red begin to trickle to the floor as a part of his bone had pierced flesh. The red mixed with the white foam to form a visceral soup. Mr. Evans' torso was being crushed even further by the immense strength of this thing. Red skin and yellowed fat fell to the floor as the ribs began to move through the flash. I felt so lightheaded, and even though I'm certain this all took place in under a minute, it felt like a nightmare that had no end. I could only remain motionless and hope that the police would arrive soon. I could see tears well in Mr. Evans' eyes as the large mouth slowly loomed over his head. White foam dripped onto Mr. Evans' head, and his teary eyes transformed into the frantic eyes of a dying animal before they were obscured by the mouth that was beginning to engulf his head. The muffled scream still came through, and then, with one rapid movement, the mouth closed, the teeth slamming down onto Mr. Evans' neck and then shaking him back and forth like a dog does with a chew toy. I heard the snapping of his neck, and the tearing of flesh and muscle before her, I saw Mr. Evans' body separate from his head. His lifeless form fell to the ground, more red where his head used to be. Bits of matter dripped from the mouth of the thing to join the soup on the floor. I laid on top of the metal shelf, my body racked with extreme pain. I felt so weak, close to death. I couldn't stop shaking, couldn't control my bodily functions. I had witnessed what had happened to Mr. Evans by something that I still can't explain, and now I feared it was going to come finish me off. It lumbered over towards me. I could see the darkness of its gigantic mouth, its teeth stained red. But as I laid there waiting for my end, the thing instead had decided to begin pacing around the store. I lost sight of it at times as it moved behind me somewhere, but it would always reappear as it skulked around the store. I could hear the footsteps of the thing as it trudged through the store. Each footstep reverberated in my brain as my body screamed out in agony. Eventually the door opened, and I heard two sets of footsteps enter the building. It was the two men from earlier, 
They wore suits and looked like some sort of agent. Uh, I remember crying out for help, but I'm not sure if anything even came out. No, oh, come on. One man yelled almost immediately upon seeing the body of Mr. Evans, but he didn't move from his spot. I wasn't sure what was going on anymore. I could hear the thing still pacing around the store somewhere behind me. The man, wearing these sunglasses, looked in my direction. It seemed that he had summed me up, but was completely indifferent to my plight. I heard a beeping sound as a man held down a button on a small handheld radio. Pierce the subject has ate a man. Got another one here that is injured pretty bad. Bile skin has eroded almost completely. How do we proceed? There was a brief pause and a crackling sound came through the radio. Retrieve the subject and we'll take care of things on our end. How much did it eat this time? One guy is missing a head. Not a pretty sight. Another guy is still alive, but he lost his arm, it seems. The man responded. The radio had beeped again. Roger, we'll work on it. The response crackled over the radio. A flash of anger crossed the man's face. Yeah, you'll work on it. We've heard that before. Why the heck do you keep sending these things out to interact with people? You could at least test it with animals or better yet. Test the things with dummies so we don't have to constantly clean up your mess. The man responded. The radio crackled once more. Do I need to remind you who signs your paycheck? Quit your bickering. The testing process will take some time and some sacrifice. Things aren't like comic books. You don't just inject some serum and get a functional super soldier. We'll iron things out on our end. You only need to worry about your job. There is a pause before the radio crackled again. You said there is a survivor there. Yeah, the kid looks like he's in terrible shape. Probably only has a few minutes left. Should we finish the job? My body tensed as I heard them say that. I wanted to get up and run, but I couldn't. I was too weak. I had lost a ton of fluid, and my vision was doubling and then blackening. The room seemed to swirl. Once more, the radio crackled alive. Don't bother, it'd be harder to explain the bullets. Sounds like he's on his way out anyway, the man said. I heard the two men march through the store, and then heard the dull sound of dragging as they pulled the thing from the building. These things are never going to work. I heard one of the men say as they dragged the thing away. I heard a car door slam and then I heard the car speed off out of the parking lot. My vision spun once more as I listened to the faint music playing through these store speakers. I looked over what was left of Mr. Evans' body. His arms were shattered. Bits of bone protruded from the skin. And his torso. God, his torso was crushed to be about half the size of what it should be. His ribs had totally collapsed. I winced painfully, trying not to look at the area where his head should be. But some sight you can't avoid seeing. And I'll never forget that image. I laid my head back on the ground and whispered to myself. I tried. Before everything faded to black. I awoke some time later in a dull gray room with curtains drawn to my right. I heard the beeping of machines and the footsteps of staff walking the hallways outside. I deduced that I was in the hospital. I was groggy, still trying to process and remember what had happened to me. Every part of my body seemed to have an ache or a pain to it. I groaned as my head throbbed. I could see that they had bandaged up my stump and for a few seconds. I felt terror as the realization hit me again that I was missing an arm. I moved my stump back and forth, not really believing it. But slowly, I came to remember and accept what had happened to me. The rest of my time at the hospital was fairly mundane as I recovered. Nurses would change my bandages, bathe me, give me painkillers. And every now and then, the doctor would stop in to check up on me. They told me that I was going to be alright despite losing my arm. And they were right. At least physically, I was going to be okay. But the trauma of the event had stung me deeply. I say that the recovery was mundane, but there was one peculiar incident that sticks out. 
There was a day that a strange doctor had walked into my room after one of my physical therapy sessions. He was odd looking, dark circles under his eyes, unkempt hair. I had been seeing two different doctors who I had become familiar with, but this guy was new. He didn't have the usual ID badge clipped to his coat that every other doctor in the hospital had. He carried a small cup in his hand, filled with some mysterious liquid. He introduced himself as Dr. Matthews, and proceeded to tell me that he was sent to give me my medicine before handing me the cup of liquid and then watching me intensely. I thought it was strange considering that I already took my typical medication about an hour earlier. Go on now, drink up. I looked down at the cup. The liquid was a nasty green color, and it had a strange chemical smell to it. I didn't feel good about drinking it or this new doctor. Well, what is it? I asked. It's for your recovery. They told me to bring it to you. He said before resuming his intense staring. I was feeling leery about this guy. His gaze fixated on the cup of my hand. And he stared with an intensity that frightened me. As I was pondering what to say or do, one of my regular nurses walked into the room. She eyed up the doctor for a second. Excuse me, who are you? The nurse asked. The man babbled out something about being a consultant for another doctor and that he was only there to bring me my medicine. For these same reasons as me, she didn't seem to buy this. And with a sharp tongue, told the man to get out before calling security. The man shuffled out of the room with haste after that. I don't know what happened after that or any of the details about the guy. The nurse took the medicine away from me, and that was the last that I heard of the incident. I went through a long depression after my release from the hospital. My life was irrevocably changed with the loss of my arm, and I was haunted for a long time by the death of Mr. Evans. I feel like I could have done more to help him, to help us escape from that nightmarish thing. I replay the situation all the time in my head, I still have the image of his lifeless body drilled into my brain. I ended up moving across the country shortly after my recovery. I needed some sort of positive change and thought that that would be the track. The blockbuster that I worked at never reopened after the incident. In fact, there was very little talk of the incident at all. No real news articles. Even the police seemed disinterested in pursuing justice. They had questioned me about what had happened, but in the end, I don't think they ever really caught the thing or the man involved with it. I've thought a lot about what that thing was, and the only explanation I can muster is that it was some sort of freak experiment set loose on us. I don't know who was behind it, the government, some secret agency, a strange cult. I don't know, but I don't think they wanted me to know about it. I've spent a lot of time looking over my shoulder, and I have the perpetual feeling of being followed. There was the false doctor, and lately I've had cars telling me suspiciously long. Last week, a weird van was parked outside of my house, and I saw people that I've never seen before walking these sidewalks in my tiny neighborhood. I've never told anyone this story before, but because of these events, I feel like I have to. This event completely and irreversibly ruined my life. I'm scared to go out, scared to do much of anything. I have no idea what the heck that thing was, but I can still hear it. The high-pitched, tinny voice repeating, hunger, plays again and again in my head. But the thing that truly scares me the most is the fact that it was created over 20 years ago. Think of how much technology has advanced in that time. If they created that thing over 20 years ago, I can only shudder when I think of what they can create today. Thank you all for listening to today's stories. I hope you enjoyed them. Wherever you are in the world, stay safe and sound, and as always, stay creepy.